Welcome to Houston Sports Talk with your host, Robert Land. Thanks for checking into the best Houston sports podcast, part of the Believe Network. And joining me to look at the Rockets drop pick prospects is a colleague on Believe, Matt Moderno, who hosts Believe in Wizards and Believe in DMV Hoops. Great to have you with us, Matt. And are you just a draft junkie? I mean, uh, you get excited this time of year? The Wizards have been so bad for most of my adult life, so you have to pay attention to the draft. So I think it's one of those things where, by necessity, uh, I kind of got into it at a young age. And I've been writing about draft prospects since probably high school at this point, early college. I did some work for Draft Express early on before they you know, got acquired by ESPN. So I've been doing this for a while, and uh, the Wizards are still bad, uh, you know, to, to nobody's surprise. So still have to pay attention to it. And uh, luckily, they're in the same range as the Rockets. So I think it makes it easy to talk about. Yeah, great empathy for uh, Wizards fans. That's that's got to be a tough existence, a, a tough existence for for a long time. I mean, the Rockets, you know, haven't been in the mountaintop in a long time, but you know they've been so relevant over the last forty years. Just yeah. it's it's been a fantastic run for the franchise. Uh, do, do you have a top three in this draft, or do you feel like the top three should be whoever fits that certain team? I think I would probably put like uh, Alex Sar, French forward slash center, and they played in Australia this year as like a slight, you know, half tier above. And then maybe there's probably five or six guys that I think a team could make the case for depending on, you know, one, how well I think they are situated to help a person address their particular holes or limitations. And then two, I do think like everyone always says draft uh, best player available. I don't really totally buy into that as this sort of like easy thing to identify. If someone is going to be locked in behind another position, you know, another person at a position and never get to play, I don't know that they ever turn into best player available. So there has to be some opportunity for minutes. There has to be some pathway for them to play a role that they're actually suited to play. And for some of these guys, I think they'll just need an opportunity to kind of play through mistakes and, and things like that. So uh, it's sort of like a wishy-washy answer, but there, there's probably like five, six, seven guys even that you could make a case for in that sort of next tier, I think. Yeah, that so, leads me to my next question. Who do you think makes the most sense for the Rockets? Because most of the mocks right now have them taking Reed Shepard. Yeah, I mean, that seems like the safe pick to me, right? Like the Rockets could definitely use some shooting. It seems like he's a pretty darn good shooter. He's around 50% from three this year and the mechanics look really solid. I don't think that's like a limited sample size fluke kind of thing. I would expect him to come in and shoot and just be be a really solid guy. I think at that size, you probably need him to be, you know, an on-ball creator, facilitator type if he's ever going to like be a 30 minute per game player for a long time. And that's really where I'm not 100% sure on Shepard. It's partly we didn't get to see it a ton this year. I've got some friends that you know do this at a pretty high level that talk about he's one of the best passers in the draft. I, I kind of personally didn't see that, but it could be one of those things where you just give him the ball and give him some opportunities. And, uh, you know, can can he be that kind of guy? Can he be even a Fred Van Fleet type, not to make like the lazy comparison there? But I don't see Fred as like this, you know, pure dynamic creator for others. He's, he's a little bit of a scoring point guard blend. I, I think Reed's probably closer to that in terms of the role you'd ideally want him to play. Could he come in, learn behind Fred for a couple of years, and then be like the cheaper alternative when you're not willing to pay, you know, Fred all that money anymore? So, so that's one angle of it. I would be a little questionable about how he kind of fits in a backcourt next to somebody like a Jalen Green if if that's the direction they want to go longer term. You know, this much better than I do, I'm sure. But there's always some chatter about are they ready to move on from Green or, or try something different here? So, I think it really kind of depends on what they want to do there and, and what their you know kind of ideal roster building philosophy really would be i don't think he'd be a bad pick but just doesn't really seem to fit in with kind of the other picks they've they've made recently you've got really explosive athletes in green eason and thompson and whitmore i understand that reed shepherd tested really well in in a vertical uh, you know in the vertical testing and things like that but i don't think he plays like the most exposed explosive player and again that could have been a product of how he was being used but somebody with a little more length and positional size seems more in that Rockets blend. If I were someone, you know, on the Rockets front office or scouting department, I, I would look for somebody that maybe compliments Shen Goon. I think he's kind of like the pillar of the front court there. So what does he not do particularly well? He doesn't really uh, protect the rim super well. He's not crazy explosive. He's not much of a shooter. So can you find someone to pair next to him? I'm not as big on the G League Ignite guys, but somebody like Modest Bezelis, maybe as sort of a, a bouncy forward, you know, weak side shot blocker next to him who can stretch the floor a little bit might be really interesting. And, and he's also somebody that would be able to play next to Eason and some of these other guys in the front court too. So that's a name I would maybe consider that I don't think I've heard you guys talk about a ton on here. I listened to the Cooper Klein episode too, and I know Modest didn't really come up. So he's something to somebody I would throw out there for Rockets fans to, to maybe take a look at. What about somebody like Steph Castle? Because I've also heard that name sure. quite a bit. We, we haven't had a chance much to talk about Steph Castle. And mm-hmm. 
you know, he's somebody that definitely does have this size. He, he didn't play on ball at Connecticut, but there's an assumption that he can do that because he's done it before, you know, earlier in his career in high school. But uh, what do you think about him? I'm a big fan personally. I, I attended the Huskies first two tournament games in Brooklyn this year and, and got to see him kind of up close and personal. And it, there was some early reporting at the combine that, uh, you know, there were some false measurements that came out that said he was only six foot two and a half. And I was like, no, no, no this is I like I promise this guy is in the six five ballpark. He ultimately measured six five and a half. So that's probably six seven ish with shoes. And uh, that's assuming he'll play basketball in shoes like most people. So, you know, pretty, pretty good size there for even if he ends up being kind of a a two guard. Uh, so I, I see him more in like the Drew Holiday blend guard where, you know, kind of a solid facilitator, not like the most, again, sort of, um, you know, dynamic creator for others, but but just pretty good at that. Going to lock you down defensively. I think he's capable enough as a driver. And then the shooting, I, I think it's going to be fine longer term. I've seen some decent touch around the rim and things like that. You also watch him before games and obviously not the most scientific way to do this, but he'll sit there and stroke three after three. So like he can make open, you know, shots, uh, things like that. He's got the touch to do it. So I, I think eventually he'll rep that out. I'm not really worried too much about that. He's probably never Steph Curry, but uh, you probably just need him to be solid enough if he's going to be a lockdown defender and creator. And he's also somebody that makes sense next to some of the other guys you got. He, he plays defense. He's a Ime Yudoka, like perfect person, you know, like could he even come in and just be like the Marcus Smart type guard for you early on of somebody who's going to lock down, create enough for others. And, and just guard bigger or smaller in the lineup, depending on what you need. So I, I think he'd actually be like a really good fit. Yeah, if you could get him there, hey, he fits the athletic mold as well. And you can let Green or somebody do a little bit of scoring. You can play him next to Fred. Like he, he just fits with a lot of different options they have there too. Yeah, the other thing about him is when I think about uh, somebody that they can bring in that's got some incredible shooting like Reed Shepard, you go, okay, wow. I mean, the Rockets could really use that because it's, sure. it's really the, the poor – area of this young core, mm -hmm. especially guys like Shangun and Amen who just can't shoot at all. So how can you bring in yet another guy that's going to be a shooting issue? But at the same time, Matt, when you watch the playoffs, it's scary to watch anybody that's under 6'3", or, you know, it's just, it, 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 you can't even imagine it defensively. And it's mm -hmm. just such a liability. And, and you know, you, you're always thinking, okay, what, what, what are we building to get to that next level? Yeah. I mean, you look at what the team is trying to do, I think, and and you bring in a coach like Ime, who's going to be this tough, gritty, defensive minded coach is how I think of him, at least. And then the blueprint of the other guys that drafted, like, I don't think Jalen Green's been the defender. Anybody has maybe wanted him to be or the physical tools suggest he could be. But that was sort of the blueprint when you took him. And, and Tari is this switchable kind of free safety defender who could be all over the place. And I think that's the same thing they envisioned for Amon Thompson. So if that's like really the the blueprint for the team is to build around defense. And honestly, I think you need to be able to to have like these really good perimeter or wing defenders. If you have somebody like Shangun, who, you know, I think is kind of maybe the lower half of starting centers in the NBA in terms of defense. Like he's another guy that fits that mold. And it just, it doesn't matter how good you are on the rim. If nobody can get by you and get to the rim. And I, I think Castle is one of those guys that, that can really, um, you know, kind of lock people down. And I, I this is sort of anecdotal, but I, I guess, uh, Danny Hurley said that Castle showed up the first day of practice and basically said like, all right, I'm the best defender on the team. Which one of you is competing for number two? And like to get that for a freshman on a, you know, a title winning team to come in and say like, I will be the stopper of this group, I think is really that kind of like culture setter that, that a lot of these teams need. So I, I think he'd be a great pick for, uh, for the Rockets too. I haven't had a chance to look much at Bazellus for Rockets fans that, you know, just weren't interested in the G league much this year. And it's hard to blame them for that. You know, what is Bazellus? I mean, give us, you know, maybe some guys that he reminds you of. Yeah, so he's he's about a 6'9", 6 6'10", 6 uh, sort of bouncy athlete with a decent jump shot. It's it's maybe slightly less textbook form, but but it's a clean enough stroke, looks repeatable, seems to have pretty good touch. So I think he's a guy that could eventually, when he gets bigger and stronger, you know, with time, uh, be a guy that maybe guards some fives or plays small ball five and would allow you to be like a really running, fast break, switchable unit. Uh, but probably ideally is a, is a power forward long term, but also can kind of switch up enough to to stay in front of like more dynamic athletic guards. So, you know, if he can switch, honestly, maybe even two through five in, in some situations, uh, it seems to make a lot of sense for me. So in terms of guys he reminds me of, I, he's a little tough to, to peg because the G League was just such a mess this year. They didn't really have any point guards. I don't think he got to see the full sort of skill set there. I heard somebody say, like, could he be like a Lamar Odom type the other day? I don't think he has those kind of playmaking chops. But as a power forward, he's going to be a guy that can put the ball on the floor reasonably well. I think attack closeouts and things like that. So, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think of like a good uh, guy he reminds me of in the league. But 
just in terms of like build and things like that, probably like Atari is somebody like a physical frame sort of comparison. I think he's a better shooter for sure. He's got a better basketball IQ. You know, Atari came in, it was kind of wild and all over the place and, and they kind of had to sort of rein him in a little bit. I don't think you have to do that with Buzelis, but you know, he's somebody who could protect the rim a little bit for you on the weak side. Could, could he be a John Collins type? That's sort of how I think of him potentially. And that's probably like the, the closest kind of maybe guy I can think of here. You're right there with the Wizards. So, you know, you kind of wonder what are they going to be doing with yeah. their pick in the draft? And when you look at the whole situation, you go, SAR seems to be on everybody's board as number mm-hmm. one. So it's almost going to be surprising if he somehow isn't number one, if either sure. the Hawks don't pick him or maybe somebody jumps up and decides they want to get him and we'll give up something for him. But do the Wizards take Risa Shea? I mean, what are you hearing? Yeah, that's an interesting one, too. I, I guess the Hawks front office was in France to watch Risa Shea down the stretch, and he probably had his best game of the year. He went for like 28, you know, six and four or something like that. And that's probably pretty compelling for them to see that, you know, from the front row. So, I mean, there's an outside chance they would go for for someone like him, especially if they're committed to keeping the guards they have in place right now. He'd probably be, be great on the wings, and then you keep Capella in a Congo. So I think there maybe is a puncher's chance they would take someone like that, in which case I think the Wizards would almost definitively take Sar as well. So... If you're a Rockets fan and you like Sar, I think the chances of him dropping all the way to three are, are pretty close to zero. I think if uh, you're the Wizards, Risa J is probably the next best bet. I think that's been sort of the subtle reporting is that one of those two French players is is going, uh, if whoever's left on the board there. So that would be my gut. He's also someone that I think makes a reasonable amount of sense for Houston if he falls to three. He could bring you that shooting right away. He's just really solid. I, I think of the Rockets as a couple of guys that, that need to be maybe sort of like reined in a little bit in, in terms of like their energy and, and freneticness, you know, with like the Taris and even Amon to some extent. But Risa J is just going to be coming in and like really solid. You don't have to worry about him a whole lot. I think he'd be another fit that that makes that sort of 6'9", switchable defensive mold that they're they're looking at too. So uh, he's probably the, the the betting favorite, I think, for the Wizards to take at two. And then if not, somebody like a Steph Castle may make some sense for, for them. There's been some rumblings that, you know, maybe they'll just go uber safe and take a Donovan Klingon. Uh, the Wizards need front court depth, sort of, uh, you know, as bad as any team in the league potentially. Uh, but you, if you look at the sort of makeup of their front office, they've got two guys from that Oklahoma City front office uh, prior under Sam Presti. And, and I don't think Klingon is necessarily like a Sam Presti Thunder kind of guy. So I would be shocked personally if that's the pick at number two. There's also maybe a world where the Wizards try to trade down with someone. I think it's probably unlikely. But uh, yeah, just the long-winded way of answering your question is, is Risa Chase probably uh, the betting favorite, I think, for, for them to take it to? I guess if there's a positional need, really, for the Rockets, it's point guard because the thought is that Amen's just not going to – it's going to be a project just to get him there, especially as weak as his handle is right now. And then Jalen Green, best case is he's just a secondary ball handler. It right. looks like at this point, if he indeed uh, sticks around after this year and they decide to keep him. And then the other – thing is that Fred Van Vliet's leaving in a year, most mm-hmm. likely. So Nikola Topic is the only other guy besides maybe Reed Shepard that seems like it, it, it could, or in Castle as well, that could be that kind of guy. What do you think about him? Yeah. So like you said, he's, he's a big point guard. He's six foot six. He's one of those guys that just going to pick people apart in the pick and roll, especially as a passer. But if you're not sort of the most dynamic athlete, you probably have to be able to shoot it at a reasonable clip. And, and that's really been the big question mark for him so far. Three-point shooting not been ideal. I think he shows decent touch on floaters and even some of the passes he makes. So I think he probably, similar to Castle, ends up like a solid NBA shooter, never a great one. Not great defensively, but I think if you're going to be a question mark on the defensive end, at least having positional size kind of makes that a little harder for teams to hunt you. Whereas, you know, somebody like Reed or even his his college teammate, Rob Dillingham, is someone that I've kind of wondered about. Could the Rockets reach for potentially uh, at three as a potential Fred uh, replacement? I, I probably wouldn't do that if I were them, but for Topic, it's it's somebody that uh, has had two kind of lower body injuries this year that have both been non-contact. That would make me uh, a little hesitant to, to pull the trigger on him at three because you just can't afford to have a guy that that's going to be kind of lingering from an injury perspective too. So the physical is going to be really important there. I think the workouts are going to be important, although I don't know that he'll be back and playing before the draft enough to even work out with people. So so that's also sort of a question mark there too. If you can't bring him in and can't see him in person. Does that kind of make you gun shy about taking a guy like that with the third pick? So, well, need to see what his time frame actually looks like or timetable for return looks like. Uh, so, he'd be a reasonable fit, though. I, I think you've got enough af- athletes on the perimeter to kind of make up for him. He's another sort of that European mold, high IQ, ball movement guy that I think would make 
a decent amount of sense with someone like Shengun too. I, I think the pick and roll reads between the two of them would, would be really, um, really, really hard to guard. So you heard what Cooper had to say about Donovan Klingon. Yep. Uh, I wasn't high on Klingon. What, what do you think? Yeah, like I, I saw some sort of criticism he got where like, well, maybe he wasn't as quite as explosive at the combine or a standing reach wasn't quite as high as people suggested. And it just really doesn't matter when you're that big. Like people are going to be reluctant to try to shoot over you, I think is probably the best way to put it. Watching him again, front row in the tournament there, he was one of those guys where just guys would get into the lane, see him and immediately backpedal out of the lane because you, you just can't go at someone like that. Some of the ESPN guys have talked about, you know, oh, we think he's really switchable long term. He moves his feet well. I don't know that I see that. I, I think he's probably exclusively a drop coverage big. I don't really buy the shooting. Every year there's some center that's huge and doesn't have these sort of great shooting indicators for long term that comes in. And, oh, he made all these shots at the combine. It was Mark Williams a couple of years ago, like that Walker Kessler went and did that. And these are guys that don't or Derek Lively did it last year. Like you, you don't ever actually end up seeing them shoot any threes. I think Derek Lively hit zero threes this year. Mark Williams hit zero threes this year. So um, maybe he can do it long term. I wouldn't buy into that. I think that's you take him with the expectation that he's a non shooter. And then if if he eventually does, that's sort of like a, an icing on the cake kind of situation for you. So can you afford another non shooting big? And it's not that Shingun, I think, is a non shooting big, but you know, that's he's not a stretch forward or, or center necessarily. So do you really play the two together all that much, especially with some of the limitations from a shooting perspective? you know, on the perimeter, on the wing. So I, I think he would be a bad fit for Houston personally. Uh, so I would kind of steer away from that. But there are certain teams I think he makes a lot of sense for. And if you're willing to play a certain kind of way, he makes sense. It's just, it really comes down to these teams and their team building philosophy. And if you take Klingon and the expectation is he's a long-term starting center for you, you're locking yourself into maybe one particular style of play defensively. Like this is a drop coverage big and we have to play that way. If you take a really small point guard, similarly, you're probably going to have to protect for that guy with all your other people. Whereas if you take some of these bigger, more switchable guys, I think it gives you flexibility with how you build out the rest of that roster around them. And also Cooper's concern, and, and I feel like it was one of the things that I hadn't heard a, a ton about him is his finishing ability, because if he can't shoot, then he's got to be able to finish around the basket, especially at that size. I mean, it's just, there's no point in getting somebody that size that can't finish around the basket if they can't shoot. I don't know that I necessarily buy that. This is a guy that, that came into college kind of, out of shape and pudgy and things like that. And, and like strength and conditioning probably hadn't been a focal point for him in high school. So he's something that'll get bigger. You know, he's going to get more physically strong. Most of the things he's going to be asked to do are catch lobs and dunk them. I don't really have any concern about him doing that or the occasional duck in here and there. I, I think he's got decent touch around the rim too. So I, I don't think that's the thing that would hold me back from taking him. But if you're envisioning like the Brooke Lopez type immediate stretch center, like I, I know Brooke didn't come in right as a way as a shooter, but he had kind of, elite, elite touch around the rim that, that made you think, all right, he's got soft enough hands to kind of do this. Uh, I, I don't see Klingon being that kind of guy. Like I said, if, if he did, it'd be more of a happy accident to me. So less worried about the finishing than, than Cooper was, but uh, all the other stuff would kind of like steer me away from, from him if I were the Rockets. One of the things that, you know, Rockets fans would, would love to do is just be able to move down and maybe pick up a piece, move down a few sure. spots. Is there any t team that you see in this top 10 that would be a, Interested in moving up a little bit? That's going to be so hard to tell for this particular draft, I think, because it just, there's so little that kind of separates a lot of these guys. And I, I think it's going to be one of those like beauty is in the eye of the beholder situations. So I think it could definitely happen, especially on draft night, where you see a situation where, hey, we really like this one guy and we're at eight or nine or whatever, and he's still there at five or six and we didn't think he would be. Maybe we could hop up to get him. In terms of teams that maybe would want to trade up, I think Portland has seven and 14 in this year's lottery. Could they consolidate those and, and work out something with the Rockets to get up to three? If there was a guy they really liked, you know, I don't know that they need like two more young lottery picks to try to mix in with some of the other guys they've got there between Sharp and Scoot Henderson. So, you know, maybe they want one big time prospect as opposed to two solid ones. I, I'm also, if I'm Houston, I don't know that I'd want two rookies from this year's draft. So trying to get two lottery picks out of it maybe wouldn't be the way I would go. So, so maybe more to your point. Could they trade down to seven or eight or, or something like that and get, you know, another guy uh, that that might be sort of an interesting proposition for for teams. Um, you, you look at someone like Memphis that's picking at nine. Could they be interested in getting a more ready to win piece? So to, and give you a long like a a more raw younger guy like a Santi Aldama back or something like that. Would that make sense for the Rockets to, you know, trade two and a win now kind of guy for 
for nine and another younger up and coming sort of dude, something like that might be worth exploring, I think. But nobody immediately comes to mind that I think is going to be like in a big hurry to get up to number three. Yeah, that's the concern if you want to do something with that capital, which yep. it's just a weird, weird draft. I, I just, I've never seen much of a draft like you got to go. Really, the Anthony Bennett one is the is the next weirdest draft yep. that, that I can remember. Um, you, you you've seen a few of the Rockets games. Just the last thing I wanted to ask you was about Jalen Green and like, what are you seeing right now? What do you think about Jalen Green? Because that that is nonstop here. If you're a Rockets fan conversation. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I totally understand why. Uh, so, again, I, I'm framing all of this as for the lens of a Wizards fan where we had a general manager and Tommy Shepard who immediately got promoted from assistant GM and came in and said, we're going to take athletic, bouncy wings who can shoot. And then they never ultimately drafted athletic, you know, bouncy wings who could shoot. So just looking at Jalen Green sort of as an archetype, uh, he would have been really uh, an intriguing player for for us as a fan base. So I, I've kind of always had a soft spot for him and a couple other ignite guys and it's maybe why i'm i'm a little lower on someone like ron holland too that the dudes that have come out of the ignite have just sort of not maybe lived up to expectations so i don't know if that's a failure from them as a program from a development standpoint or hey these were the guys sort of in that covid evaluation you know time frame so maybe we kind of missed the mark on them a little bit but i really thought there'd be more to green there than just at least i see him as this sort of like slightly inefficient scorer who's like a decent transition finisher and things like that. I don't know if that's exactly how Rockets fans view him, but I, I thought he'd have a little more creation. I thought he'd be a little better defensively. Uh, I thought he'd even maybe have a little bit more, you know, sort of wiggle with the ball. And and I think at times he gets a little sloppy. So at the, the tools are there. I, I could see him also being one of these guys where you give up on him at a young age and trade him off or something. And then two, three, four years down the road, you're really kicking yourself because it just took him a little longer for all those things to click. So, they're not like at this, hey, we have to win now right away kind of time frame. So I would probably be patient and stretch it out and and just really try to lock in with him and, and make sure he's on the same page with us about how to actually, you know, turn into the player we want him to be and and, and fill that particular role for us. I think Udoka is a good, no-nonsense kind of coach for him. And, and you saw some of these other guys in, in Boston kind of fill in the pieces or fill in the blanks or gaps around their game uh, under him. So I think he's in the right place. He's got the right people. Even someone like a Dylan Brooks is probably really good for him from a, you know, a swag attitude perspective, like showing up, having accountability defensively, things like that. So I, I think there's enough raw tools there that I would hold on for as long as humanly possible. And if you get to a point where it's sort of untenable long term or like inefficient shooting from him is uh, and high usage is holding back other guys, then, you know, maybe you get to that point. But I, I'd wait to see a little bit more what I have from Cam Whitmore and Amon Thompson and things like that before I felt like real pressure to to kind of move on from him. Is that, I don't know, where, where are you at with that, Robert? Well, you said the key phrase right off the top. You said, oh, the Wizards would love to have an athletic guy who could shoot. And I was like, oh, Jalen Green is that guy? Uh, who can shoot? The who can shoot part is just the problem. The theoretically that's, shoot, yeah. Yeah, that's the, I mean, that's the whole story with him. I mean, if if he could shoot better than 31 or 33% from three, and it's his mid-range is not too bad. I mean, it's getting better. And I, I feel like we saw, didn't see a bunch of progress the first two years for reasons beyond Jalen Green, but mm -hmm. what once Udoka got there in this last year, that that mid range has looked a little bit more like okay, that's a guy that can do something, but he sure. still has to get the three point shot, and it's just it's it's that inefficiency, and you feel like it's in there somewhere because you look at the free throws and the free throw percentage and all of that, and you're like, oh, it's there, and then we saw it for a month, but then you know it's one of those deals where it's like okay, I got to see more, I want to see more mm -hmm. and more and more, and you got to keep it up and. You know, he did it in March, but really the, the, the end of the season wasn't good for him at all. And, you know, it's it, it, and it wasn't there were there were people that were making it, you know, maybe about, well, it's the fact that he didn't have Shangoon or whatever. And I'm like, no, there were still shots he was getting that mm -hmm. were open. You know, that's not ever been the problem. Jalen yeah. gets some open shots because he's not shooting good. And they they yeah. understand that. Yeah, I think some of this, too, is like, all right, you're, you're an 80 percent, 80 percent free throw shooter. You probably have decent enough touch. I think some of this stuff is mental for guys like that too. And, and that maybe goes back to that sort of G league ignite framework. If he had even gone to one year of college and played like higher stakes basketball, it, you it toughens you up pretty quickly, I think. And, and you really have to learn to be able to play through some of those situations. Whereas with the ignite, there's like a hundred people in the crowd for all your games for a year. And now you show up and it's, it's sort of trial by fire in the league and guys are going under screens on you for the first time in your career. They're leaving you wide open. Sometimes I, I think sometimes it gets mental with some of these guys too, where, you know, you hear this guy's in the gym and he knocks down every single shot when he's, you know, 
no lights are on him, but you put him in the gym and, and now he's a brick. Like that, that may be one of the things that's happening with uh, green there. It's just got to find a way to build up his confidence. Maybe a couple, you know, hot weeks in a row, get him, get him going a little bit. I don't know, but he looks like a guy who should be able to shoot. Uh, every time I, I see him, I think forms pretty decent touch is pretty decent. So I'm always a little surprised when you look and see, you know, a one for six night from three or something like that from him. Yeah, it's it, it's tough to judge this guy because it was AAU ball for basically three years between the G League and and the two Silas years and yep. didn't affect Shangun as much because Shangun came from that professional background, but right. Jalen didn't. So that's that's it's one of the hard things. And it's like we, we tend to compare their progress because the two of them came in at the same time at the same age. But that's been the, the, the big issue. Um, we talked about off the top, believe in Wizards. You've also got uh, believe in DMV hoops. Uh, we, we know what Believe in Wizards is to people that um, might not know. What What is the other show? So the D.C., Maryland, Virginia metro area, we call the DMV, and, and we're pretty proud of our basketball that comes out of this area. Uh, it's a point of pride for us. We think the sort of the local high school leagues here are the best in the country, and there's a ton of really good players that come out of this area. There's a Showtime documentary a couple years ago. Uh, it was called In the Water. It was about sort of uh, Prince George's County, Maryland, right outside of D.C., a D.C. suburb, suburb and just you know, the, the level of talent that comes out of this particular area. So just kind of focusing on all levels of basketball here, telling stories from, from guys that are playing at the local colleges, interview the local uh, kind of D1 coaches, guys that are up and coming, uh, you know, four or five star recruits in the area and things like that too. So just really trying to focus on, hey, there's more here than just this pro basketball team and, and trying to show some love to some of these other uh, cool, maybe, you know, stories that, that don't get the same kind of um, national spotlight and things like that. Sounds great. We can appreciate it more that you took some time to come on with us, especially in the crazy draft season. Thanks. Yeah, good luck. You're listening to Houston Sports Talk. Hey, don't forget to support us by subscribing and commenting on YouTube. You can always listen to us on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends about us and share our show links on social media. Spread the word, everybody. Thanks for listening.